Let's go! LSU football fans, I'm going to need your help filling out this offensive depth chart. We did the updated defensive depth chart, and we're doing the same thing. I'm going to show you what I had pre-spring and what I think the LSU depth chart looks like now. Starting off here with wide receiver pre-spring, our three wide receiver set was Kayshawn, Coy, and Jure. And post-spring, we're going to stick with that same group right there. And look, this is the deepest position on the team. Every one of us have our own opinions of who's going to be the number two option. And that's, you know, the popular thing you've seen from local media and fans and message boards. But this is a bottom line. You need three wide receivers. That is the most common set. The days of the fullback are over. I'm sorry, PFD commenter. There's no more fullbacks. And you're only more often than not going to have one tight end. So it's not that LSU needs a number one receiver. They already have that in Keishon Butte. And they're not even looking for a number two. They're looking for their best three wide receiver set. Keep in mind, Jake Peets is going to have some outside-the-box ideas, but Ed Orgeron said he wants this 2019 offense back to a T, which leads us to the backups. If he wants the team to run the offense to a T, that means LSU will not rotate at wide receiver really at all. In 2019, LSU stuck with their elite three, which was, of course, Jamar, uh, Justin, and Terrace. They just did not rotate those three guys out. Now, of course, Terrace got injured, and you got more snaps from Derek Dillon and whatnot. So this is the conundrum. You have a loaded wide receiver group with John Trey Kirkland, obviously, with the spring game performance. Trey Palmer, who started off slow. His Ole Miss game, though, was really good outside of that bad drop. Devonta Lee, who is starting to make waves in the spring. He probably improved his stock more than anyone. And then you have Alex Adams, the three-star from Mississippi, entering year two. Only one catch for six yards in um, it last season. But I know Ed Orgeron tried moving him to safety. I don't know if that experiment failed. Yes, the unit is deep. But this was a common complaint I got from you, and I felt this way as well. LSU, not only at wide receiver, but at running back, rotated far too often. And I think I have a remedy to that situation. But we'll get to all of that here uh, in just a second. But this is a big thing. Is LSU going to stick with a certain group, or will they rotate a lot? Because you then have these guys, one of the most talented crops of wide receivers LSU has ever brought in, with Deion Smith, Brian Thomas Jr., Malik Neighbors, Chris Hilton, and Jack Bash. Now, here's the thing. We're actually going to do a wide receiver week on this channel where we're going to dive deep into this position. I'm going to share my personal opinions of who I think the bona fide number two and who I think out of this group is actually the best wide receiver because I have my own personal opinion, but history tells us something different. So I'm going to save my personal evaluation for all five of these guys when we actually do that video. But number one here is Deion Smith because he was an early enrollee, which puts him ahead of the others. But any one of these five guys can crack the lineup. But here's the fascinating thing. We're getting ready to move to running back and tight end eventually. But I don't think we're done with the wide receivers. You guys are going to love this because Jake Peets is thinking outside the box. And I think you will think outside the box with me. Now, we move to running back. John Emery and Ty Davis Price were our pre-spring starters. Now, of course, you can only start one. But going into the spring, these two guys had a wide um, gap between them and everyone else on the team. And post-spring, I still feel the same way. Look, John Emery and TDP, they toughed it out during the spring. They had their own injuries that they were dealing with. John Emery, of course, in that yellow non-contact uniform. Ty Davis Price, uh, as well, fighting through injuries. He had that crazy spring game, two long runs. Both of them were probably a byproduct of DeMond Clark not being in the right spot. But still, Ty Davis Price really carried the weight in that game. Now, this is where it gets fascinating. It's put up or shut up time for both of them. Uh, they both had decent true freshman campaigns in 2019. Of course, that was the, the Clyde Edwards Hilaire show. 2020, not so much. How much of it was the offensive line being not so great? Probably a good bit. A lot of it also was not having Joe Burrow at quarterback. But this is a problem. Both of them have not 
done enough to make you truly believe, 110% believe, that either one of them are going to break out. Now they can. They definitely have the talent, in particular John Emery, the former five-star. I think and I hope that they break out. Now, I'm going to shout out Carvis, one of our most loyal viewers. He believes they have Sony Michelle and Nick Chubb level, uh, uh, that type of ceiling. I don't necessarily see that, I hope, because if that's the case, LSU's going back to the college football playoff if these two are that good. So, yeah, this is very complex because we bring in Ed Orgeron with these backups here. Armani Goodwin, Corey Connor, Trey Bradford, and Josh Williams. Ed Orgeron repeatedly said during the spring that these two freshmen coming in are going to get their opportunities to play right away. These are Kev Falk's first recruits at running back as a position coach. It's Kev Falk enters year two with this position group. So you also got to keep in mind the actual position coaches. Uh, we didn't mention Mickey Joseph. He got his extension as a wide receivers coach. Um, and DJ Mangus, of course, new into that equation. But this is Kev Falk with his first two recruits that are his guys at running back. So that's going to be very fascinating. Of course, you have Trey Bradford. Overall, pretty good game against Ole Miss. But... We get to Josh Williams, who probably had just as good a game. And Josh Williams is a former walk-on. Of course, Chris Curry no longer a part of this team. He's at Utah. Best of luck to him. But this is where the running back position gets so fascinating. It's not so much who can run the best out of the backfield. It is who can catch the football out of the backfield the best. Remember, one of the biggest jumps in Jake Pete's career was becoming the running backs coach with the Carolina Panthers and his running back of course was Christian McCaffrey who is most known for his receiving ability out of the backfield so that is something that is very important to him as a coach a running back who can also catch passes out of the backfield and if Ed Orgeron wants to bring the 2019 offense back to a tee that was a major X factor for LSU, Clyde edwards helaire and his ability to not only catch the football out of the backfield. Overall, Clyde was a decent pass protector, and he was really good with Joe Burrow catching footballs hot off of unblocked blitzers. This was something that LSU won the game with against Alabama. When Joe Burrow was under heavy pressure, he would just dink it off to Clyde edwards helaire and he would make play after play after play on top of being a really good cutback runner in that LSU scheme. So that's where things get complex with these running backs because so much of what they do is really dependent on the quarterback. Is LSU going to run out of shotgun? Well, if you run out of shotgun, that's more effective when you have a running quarterback. And obviously we'll get the quarterback in just a second. And then on top of that, are we going to be under center at all? Uh, because, you know, TDP, one of his best runs was when uh, T.J. Finley was under center in the spring game. So if Miles Brennan is your quarterback, maybe that will help out your offense a little bit. So there are so many factors when it comes to this position, which gets us to our first outside-the-box idea in this video, a two-minute back, and that, of course, being Coy Moore. I said, of course, as if this is a common idea. Now, before you guys flame me for my idea, hear me out here. The LSU running back position last season, I know we're so keyed in on this guy is this position, but just like we've seen in basketball, football is starting to become more positionless. You have to be able to do just a little bit of everything. You have to be able to motion to both sides of the line of scrimmage. You have to be able to run routes out of the backfield, even if you're a wide receiver. We saw Florida do that very effectively with uh, Kadarius Toney. Alabama do that very effectively with Devonta Smith. Positionless. Can you do more things at your position? And look, LSU's running backs, it's a big thing for Jake Peets to have a running back out of the backfield who can catch. And you look at the SEC last season. I believe there were eight different running backs in the SEC that had 24 or more catches, according to CFBStats.com. Last season, the high catcher on LSU was John Emery, with 14 catches, and there were a lot of drops, not only with Emory, but with Bradford and whoever they tried to run out of the backfield. In fact, LSU's true running backs only had 26 catches combined, 
with a lot of drops and a lot of miscommunication and so on and so on. So if you can't get a receiver out of the backfield, especially if you're in the two-minute drill, let's put Coy Moore at running back. And I understand pass protection might be an issue, but that's another thing. This was something John Emery wasn't really good with last season in particular, pass protection out of the backfield. You need a good personal protector back there. And look, pass protection as a running back comes down to desire. It comes down to um, acting quick. And look, I don't know how much worse of a pass protector Coy Moore would be than anyone else on the team because none of them in particular are really that great at it. If I was to pick one, I would say probably TDP is the best out of that. But Coy Moore's value as a two-minute running back was really shown in that last drive of the spring game. And I understand it's a spring game, but Coy Moore made a few catches on that drive, including the final touchdown that really got Garrett Nussmeyer going, and it really got that offense going, and it really gets me thinking. Coy Moore, who is a sharp route runner, a hard worker, a guy that volunteered himself to move himself to the running back position when the depth got really thin this spring. We move on to tight end, and Cole Taylor was our pre-spring starter, and he is going to be our post-spring starter as well. Now, uh, Cole Taylor last season was not ready. He was a three-star out of Colorado, and he was forced into action because, well, that Eric Gilbert thing happened, and Cole Taylor, of course, the iconic Florida shoe flip, we will never forget it. He, of course, is a team first guy, stepped in, but... Here's the thing about Cole Taylor. Now, I know I'm risking this because we have gained viewers in Grand Junction, Colorado. Uh, We've had commenters bring this up. But going back to the film, I've always said this about every true freshman. 90% of them are not ready to play in year one. And Cole Taylor was definitely that case. Which brings up these backups here. Nick Storrs, Jack Besh, Jack Mashburn, and Jalen Sheed. Mashburn's an interesting guy. You saw him a lot in the spring drills that we saw. Um, Jalen Sheet, of course, is an incoming true freshman. He wasn't there in the spring, a three-star to Mississippi State, or out of Mississippi. But the two top names here, Nick Storrs, who is by far the best blocking tight end on this roster. He showed uh, some receiving ability. He had a catch in the spring game. And then, of course, Jack Besh, who is listed as a wide receiver tight end at St. Thomas Moore. He was mostly a wide well he was just a wide receiver he's got a pretty solid frame I don't know if his body would be ready to be a tight end in year one maybe Nick Storrs is the better option if LSU is going to have that tight end tight at the end there (laughs) that sounds kind of weird which leads us to another outside the box idea so if you don't have a tight end on the roster who can't block It's better to just have him spread outside and just spread out the defense, right? So if that's the case, why have a tight end on the field at all? Just run four wide receiver sets. This is where Jack Besh becomes a very interesting name because, you know, if if he's going to bulk up and play some tight end, you know, the value of having a receiver there, if he can't block, is more so than having a guy that can't block at all play tight end. So... I don't think LSU is going to be married to the idea that Cole Taylor is going to have to be on the field at all times. When I went back to rewatch basically every game this season, you can see why LSU really wants to get Eric Gilbert back because he started to give you a little bit more as a blocker. He made a few good blocks in that Alabama game in particular. So yeah, I totally get it. But look, I'd rather just a fourth wide receiver be on the field if we can't get good blocking at that tight end position. So if you're Nick Storrs watching this or deep cut, if you're Jake Johnson watching this, uh, obviously Jake Johnson's 2022, but goodness, this position is wide open, wide open. Now, two-minute offense. Before we get to the offensive line here, Kayshawn, Jare, Jontre, your running back be Coy Moore and that tight end instead be a fourth wide receiver This is what I was talking about with Jake Peets. He is a very open guy, open-minded guy. And I could see him seeing this logic. 
why in our two-minute offense do we not put our five best receivers on the field, especially if Coy Moore could be a receiving running back? You don't have to have a tight end on the field. You simply don't. Uh, Guess what? Thad Mosses don't grow on trees. Think about it, at the very least. Why not play this offense more often? This would put defenses in conflict, especially if you can get some rushes from Coy Moore out of the backfield. I think this is something LSU will explore, especially considering that the running backs aren't great receivers and the tight ends overall aren't great blockers. So so we continue here. This is your pre-spring offensive line. The same five guys we had before spring here, Dare Rosenthal, Ed Ingram, Liam Shanahan, Jason Hines, and Austin Deculus. And our post-spring offensive line, the same thing, okay? Now, you guys know how I feel about this offensive line, okay? And I understand I have gotten a few comments. Uh, quit talking about it. Well, you know, it, it the, the problem isn't going to go away. Dear Rosenthal, by far to me, had the best spring game. He did a really good job in pass pro versus Ojolari. Ed Ingram had his ups and downs. This is a big year for him. I saw him get hype when he was listed on the Senior Bowl watch list. Um, so, yeah, this is a big year for him. Liam Shanahan at center. Jason Hines at right guard. Austin Deculus at right tackle. Uh, The right side of this group is the biggest issue, especially compared to the left side of this group. But the bottom line is Jason Hines was not good last season. And it was not only, you know, the blitz pickup aspect of it. He got moved a lot in the running game. I don't know what happened. I thought he was going to be pretty decent. I would consider switching him and Ingram because... Jason Hines in 2018 did play some left guard, and he was better there than what he was at right guard last season. Um, and Austin Deculus at right tackle is a major liability in, in pass protection, particularly against smaller, quicker guys. So this was the backup offensive line. This is how I have the backup offensive line currently set up. Dare Rosenthal, Ed Ingram, Liam Chanahan, Jason Hines, and Deculus as your starters. I think there are three major backups and the rest. Cam Wire at both the tackles, Anthony Bradford at both the guards, and Charles Turner there at center. Now, center, of course, is a, is a big, big question. You know, Charles Turner played the entire Missouri game. He was the one that stepped in for um, Ed Ingram because he was hurt, and it was a mixed bag. So he's got some playing experience I don't know how I'd feel about him as a center because, you know, we haven't really seen it. And the one thing you got to give credit for from Liam Shanahan, this was his first year starting at LSU. He made a lot of media appearances each and every week. There was a lot of pressure on his shoulders to work with three different quarterbacks. And by the way, in, I believe, one, two, three games minimum, Arkansas, Ole Miss, and Florida, the ball changed. (laughs) There was a huge change in weather. And there were no bad snaps. And in those three games, two of those were with freshman quarterbacks. So Liam Chanahan is not only a accurate snapper, he is someone that got better as the season went on. So he's probably, out of any of these guys, not the best offensive lineman, but probably the most valuable. Now, for me, the best backup offensive line should actually be the starting offensive line. This is how I would line it up going into next season with no biases attached to guys that have played in the past, okay? Dare Rosenthal at left tackle, Ed Ingram at left guard, Liam Shanahan at center, right guard, Anthony Bradford, and right tackle, Cam Wire. That would be the unit that I would have going into next season. And I understand, taking Deculus out of this equation it w- would sting. He's on leadership council. He's one of the few holdovers from the 2019 championship team. But the regression is a very real thing. I think he would be better at right guard, so I would be fine with Deculus at right guard and Kim Wire at right tackle, but it's it's a thing, and it's something that LSU, I'm sure, is discussing internally. Now, your backups. There's that Cardell Thomas guy in, in the top right corner of the screen. We did a deep dive on Cardell Thomas and all the unique challenges that have come his way, so if you want to watch that, uh, we won't spend too much time on Cardell here, but... Uh, this doesn't look like year three for him. It looks like year four is the year that we expect him to break out. 2019, he had the injury. 2020, he wasn't quite there. 2021, uh, you know, well, where is he right now? We'll see. His spring game was 
decent. The overall backup offensive line, though, is a problem. Marlon Martinez, Xavier Hill, we'll see how they develop. Garrett Dellinger, he is a true freshman. Don't expect too much. Kimo McAneoli, another true freshman. He wasn't an early enrollee. Those are your only two offensive line signees in this past class. And then you still have Thomas Perry there and a few other names that we didn't list. Uh, Spencer Payne and whoever else. Now, this is a key thing. 2022 offensive line recruiting is going to be fantastic. Obviously, you're going to get a great crop, especially when Emory Jones decides to commit. If you want to learn more about Emory Jones out of Catholic High Baton Rouge, there's another flashy thing in the top right corner if you want to see what he would bring to this group, along with Will Campbell, Bo Bordelon, and Lucas Taylor. But this is the thing, okay? This backup unit was not good at all in the spring game, and that is what concerns me. Your starting unit is... Um, not that great, and your backups is 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 non-playable. They they cannot play in an SEC game right now, and I would say any of them that played on the backup unit is not ready for SEC play, and that is a problem at LSU. So look, I am very worried about this unit. I do think part of the spring game and part of their struggles overall in the spring um, it is partially due to the LSU defensive line being very good and. They, they know the plays that you're running and all that stuff, but this is a thing that you that should concern you. It's not only the players themselves, okay? It's the cerebral aspect of it because this unit, both the starters and the backups, struggled versus just four-man rushes and simple twists and stunts. What the spring game didn't show you were blitzes and guys crowding the line of scrimmage and the communication as far as that. Far too many unblocked blitzers through A gaps and B gaps and Look, I am not J.T. O'Sullivan. I'm not an elite film guru, but what I can tell you, this is universal across all quarterbacks. When they come to pass protection, you must be able to block interior gaps and allow outside guys to go free over guys coming unblocked on a gap blitzers. If you want to know more about that, we did a film study Miles Brennan in the red zone versus Mississippi State, where if our guy, Chase and Hines, would have picked up a simple A gap blitz, we would have scored a touchdown and likely would have won that game. So um, these are all issues, and it goes deeper than just the guys. We the, the recruiting hasn't been there. The development hasn't been there. The cerebral aspect of it hasn't been there, and that's an issue. Okay, now, look. Last year's unit got a little unlucky with four out of the five guys going to the NFL early. But those are just excuses. We move on. Okay, so you're waiting for quarterback, right? And we say this for the end, okay? Pre-spring quarterback, Max Johnson, Miles Brennan, TJ Finley, and Garrett Nussmeyer. And nothing changed other than TJ leaving the equation. I'm going to do it again. Top right corner of the screen. And all links will be down below. We can have a discussion about TJ Finley in whatever, but this was my deep dive on TJ Finley, the God's honest truth about this young man. I think he can be great. Jake Peets is going to have to be pretty decisive about this because obviously you want to hold on to this as long as you possibly can so you can still have three scholarship rosters and have a backup that is a um, non-true freshman. Now, this is a major issue, okay? And I understand that there's a lot of people saying this. Well, if Miles Brennan doesn't get the starter's job, he's packing his bags and transferring because time is ticking. And if Max Johnson doesn't win the job, he's likely to not transfer, especially with his brother coming in. Now, I get that logic, and in a lot of ways it makes sense. But that is galaxy brain thinking. Football is a fleeting game, right? We have small sample sizes, and the games mean a lot. The bottom line is you can't play transfer portal mental gymnastics. You've got to play the best player. And we discussed this in a video where we discussed all these outside factors because some of you say, well, we should start the younger guy or the older guy or we should start Miles because he would enter the portal. Don't do that. Just pick simply the best guy. Now, who is the best out of the two of them? Well, when it comes to a vertical passing game, there is a wide gap between Miles Brennan and Max Johnson with what you can do vertically with your play calling. And that's the bottom line. Miles Brennan has a cannon. Uh, You know, the analytics and advanced stack community loves Miles Brennan because 
of what he was able to do vertically. But how much of that was the opponent and how much of that was, you know, Terrace Marshall being an absolute beast? How many of those throws did we see Miles Brennan look off of safety and go to the opposite side of the field? And on top of that, Miles Brennan is, of course, a pocket quarterback where Max Johnson gives you something in the running game, which helps out an offensive line that's not so great, which helps out a running back group that is decent at best. We've yet to see them, any of those guys be spectacular in a Division One game. So, yeah, I mean, we'll, we'll see. But to me, Max Johnson is still my QB1 because of those final factors. Do I think Miles Brennan would be a better quarterback for this offense if I felt better about the running back and the offensive line situation? Yes, but I am factoring in those factors because we're lacking at both of those positions right now, and you got to be honest about it. And I understand a lot of you say, well, we got a lot of talent there. And I agree, especially with running back, but that's the thing. We've yet to see it. And when you have a mobile quarterback, it opens up those other things. And you got to keep this in mind. Who has better chemistry with the current set of wide receivers right now? Well, it's unquestionably Max Johnson, uh, especially when you factor in game experience. Max Johnson with Kayshawn. No matter what happens, that was a legendary duo during that Florida and Ole Miss run. Um, Max and Coy Moore, they were working out with each other before... The game even started uh, versus Mississippi State weeks before. Those two have a relationship. So, yeah, I mean, I I, I like Max better for right now. But in a perfect world, you know, uh, I know a lot of you are going to bring this up. Well, look, Carter, we we saw last season with Alabama. they, They won with the pocket quarterback. Yes, they did. They also had... One of the greatest play callers in the in, in the history of the SEC. One of the greatest receivers in the history of the SEC. But on top of that, they had an elite offensive line, something we definitely don't have. And they had a running back that is better than anyone on our roster right now in Najee Harris. If you disagree with that, you're just lying to yourself. Now, if you want to have a discussion about Najee versus Clyde, it's a little bit different. But, you know, it's just the truth. The supporting cast isn't there for Miles Brennan. Um, So I'm rolling with Max for right now. Boom! So there is your starting lineup for the LSU Tigers on offense. I know a lot of you will agree or disagree with what I have to say. and, And once again, this is how I think they're going to line up next season. And look, it could be different. I have my own personal opinion, as you heard in the video, especially on uh, the offensive line. But I want your honest thoughts on today's video. Do you guys like these depth chart pieces? What do you want to see more of? I'm always open to comments, and I do want to plug our community page. I'm going to start posting more just community photos, just getting your thoughts. We did uh, your favorite LSU wide receiver of all time, and today I think we did who is your RB1, which obviously we answered in today's video. So lots of of discussion to be had and look we couldn't touch on everything in this video i'm going to be doing an eric gilbert deep dive is he someone that lsu absolutely needs for next season and we got so much good stuff it is power our lsu boom so if you want to see our lsu defensive depth chart just click that video right there and i think Tonight we're doing takeout. I don't know. I think we're doing grilled chicken salads. Let's go.